Hi, this is Guy Burgess. For this post, I'd like to talk about the meaning of social and psychological complexity. And probably the best place to start is by looking at the standard model of conflict resolution or rational decision making. If you ask the general public, folks going through uh, Grand Central Station, for example, uh, how people really make decisions, you'll probably get an answer like this, at least as an ideal. Now, the truth is, this is something of a straw man argument, uh, but there's a lot of validity to it as well. I think this is the way an awful lot of folks tend to think about human decision making, conflict resolution. And what I want to try to explain is how this gets you into trouble. But first, let's talk a little bit about what this model actually means. And it's all built around this notion of the rational man or the rational woman. Uh, at least I imagine uh, we all are at least under this model, we all have a spreadsheet running around in our head. And every time we identify an interest or a goal that we would like to pursue, uh, we assemble a list of options for advancing that particular goal or interest. Then we assess the costs and benefits of each option. Uh, we might make some adjustments for risk and uncertainty. You know, this option would be really great, but I don't think I can get it. And then finally, you go ahead and you select the most desirable option. Uh, we also do a lot of things to try to improve the process. And a lot of what you'll hear, at least in terms of improving decision making, is, well, you've got to get your emotions out of this. You've got to think rationally. And the more expertise you can get, the better. So study, get advanced degrees, get consultants, get them to assemble a better list of options and a better set of assessments of the costs and benefits of each option. Now, all of this gets scaled up. Um, in negotiation processes, which are really a multi-party rational choice model. Uh, you might have a mediator, two parties sit down at a table, they identify their interests, goals, options for achieving them, and then you try to come up with some solution that um, is as mutually beneficial as possible. And this is what you get in very large scale like negotiations. This was the Iranian nuclear deal. It just involves more parties. Um, it's also true that these kinds of negotiations, once you get into a multi-party setting, uh, occur in the context of everybody's BATNA, that is their best alternative to a negotiation, negotiated agreement. That is, can they go through the legal system, the political system, the electoral system, uh, use military power, um, all as other options other than negotiation for advancing your interests. So things have to occur within that, but the same sort of rational model holds. And the way you scale this up to huge social things um, is you use interest groups. And this is an interesting catalog of all the different interest groups in the United States. And basically, these are large groups of people who send representatives, presumably, to these negotiation process. At any rate, this is what we're talking about when we talk about the democratic ideal in a small sense. This is the power with democracy, um, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Um, but there are obviously problems with things like this. Uh, one of the most serious, and we've known about this for a long, long, long time, um, as you might call it, the Machiavellian problem, that people game the system and they negotiate in bad faith and they try to, one way or another, manipulate things. And this goes on again and again and again. Uh, you also run into the divide and conquer syndrome, uh, which wait, dates way, way back before Julius Caesar. And here the idea is you try to not encourage resolution, but you try to get everybody fighting amongst themselves so they can't put together a power base big enough to challenge your rule. Uh, but another part of the reason that this rational ideal model doesn't really stand up in the real world is that men and women are, in a very, very real sense of the word, irrational and don't follow this model. And you can say, well, that's just, oh, if they could just be rational, everything would be fine. Uh, but there's more to it than that. And we've been trying to look at this uh, throughout this seminar series uh, by thinking about the social system as a complex ecosystem, and it applies here. So we can start by thinking about what, over the long term, are, are the advantages that humans have had and why we've been able to flourish. And it's certainly not physical strength. 
Um, but what it is, is a multi-generational ability to live and work together in ever larger groups that continually adapt to our changing environment. Um, and they refine the groups, I had a professor who called it the recipe for survival or the recipe for success. So it's this ability to work together over the long term as a group that's our key evolutionary advantage. And this has huge implications. Um, what it means is that decision making, um, at least for the groups that succeed, are group oriented, not individually oriented. And that has huge implications in how we approach complex conflict. Uh, for a group to succeed, uh, it's got to work together. You've got to have a play and everybody knows their part and has to do their part. Otherwise, it doesn't work. A football diagram here is an example. Uh, this all, of course, gets translated to the social level with this whole notion of the division of labor that as a sociologist I learned that Emile Durkheim came up with in the mid-1800s. So the idea probably goes back a lot further than that. So if you think about what it takes to make the division of the labor actually work, uh, it's obviously you've got to get everybody on the same page and working together. And over the long term, societies have developed and humans have developed a wide range of mechanisms that ho help hold the group together as a functioning unit. Now, some of these are in the realm of nature. They have biological genetic orientations. This has been going on long enough that it really does have a genetic component, and a lot of it is nurture. Uh, having to do with reinforcing social relationships. So, for example, uh, a big part of it is something I call circles of trust. Uh, part of making a group succeed uh, over the long term is it's got to hold together and it trusts everybody within the group. After, of course, a whole range of mechanisms to ensure that people act in trustworthy ways, and it tends to distrust people from other groups, mostly because it's assumed that they're also trusting each other and you're in competition. So that makes a fair amount of sense. So it's not surprising that each of the individual groups has a way of looking at the world that reinforces its group identity and group priorities. Uh, you've heard the phrase rose-colored glasses, uh, or looking at the phrase world in rose-colored glasses. Well, uh, you could extend it a little bit, and on the uh, conservative side, you look at the world with uh, red colored glasses and you get a red tint to everything and a blue tint if you're on the uh, democratic side. But the point is that each side has a different frame. Now, there's been some very interesting work done on this. My favorite is a book by George Lakoff on moral politics that talks about the traditional strict father Republican worldview and the more liberal, nurturing, parent, democratic worldview. And if you think back about it, there are a lot of different personality types uh, within any group. And there are good evolutionary reasons why those personality types ought to exist and ought to coexist within a group. Uh, first, you have traditionalists. And these are folks uh, often that are much more uh, observant of religious traditions, for example, um, and their sense is this recipe of, for survival that societies developed over the long term um, is something very, very important. And there are a whole range of institutions that tend to reinforce this behavior, and they enthusiastically participate in those because it's the key to society's success. And then you'll have a few innovative liberals. And here, the, you know, the use of the word liberal, and in the literature on this, it's uh, the term liberal is often used, certainly, um, are folks that are free to or see themselves as free to try new ideas. And sometimes this is really valuable. You have guys saying, you know, this, this way we've been doing it traditionally is wrong. Society would be better if we did something different. And you have folks like Martin Luther King that call for change. Uh, so liberals, a few liberals within a traditional society, play a very important role in encouraging adaptation and progress.
but not all liberals, folks who don't want to follow the traditions are trying to make society better. Um, as a child of the 60s and 70s, I know a lot about indulgent liberals. I grew up at a time where the motto was, if it feels good, do it, and the whole sense of what you really owe to society um, sort of got lost in, in having a good time. And that tension certainly exists, and certainly a lot of people, traditionalists, see liberals as a lot more indulgent and a lot less um, interested in social progress. And before liberals start to feel too smug about how they don't have traditions that they feel bound to, and they're the free thinkers, the truth is there is a lot of orthodoxy on the liberal side of the political equation. Now, there are other ways in which group structures or groups are structured uh, in order to increase group cohesion, a formal authority structure. This is a, a organizational chart from the Department of Defense, but all sorts of elements of society have clear authority structures. And if you violate that, there are range of sanctions that are going to come into play. There's also a set of informal authority structures, which I think are even more important, where if you do something that the group disapproves of, you will quickly find yourself looked down upon by all of your friends and associates. And if you persist it, you'll find yourself uh, ostracized and maybe even exiled if you're lucky. There's also a sense in which individual thinking um, and decision-making has a kind of two-tier level to it. There's rational and non-rational thought. The metaphor that's often used is a rider and an elephant. And when everything's in harmony, it works pretty well. The rider sits upon the top of the elephant and gently guides things around. But we all, as this guy certainly figured out, uh, the elephant has a mind of its own, and the rider can be pretty much powerless to change that. And our emotions, in a sense, have a mind of their own, and all of our rational thinking uh, often is powerless against them. So you have that kind of thing. And you have psychologists. This is a fascinating little chart, and I recommend the associated reference of all of the different biases that psychologists have identified in human thinking. And these are basically all of the different ways in which people don't follow the rational model. And if you look at them, an awful lot of them, I won't say all, but a huge percentage, are basically biases that privilege the group over the individual. And if you look at evolution, social evolution from a group perspective, that starts making a whole lot more sense. So, um, we've been talking again over the course of the seminar about the importance of social adaptation. And it's clear that as you think about society in complex group terms, rather than rather simple individual terms, uh, the whole process of group adaptation is much, much slower. And that increases social lags and cultural lags, which lead to all sorts of problems. So you could be tempted to think that, well, changing the way groups think, you know, given all of these obstacles, is pretty much impossible, so we're doomed. Um, but the truth is that Kenneth Boulding's law, first law, applies. If it's something that's being done, it must be possible. And there are folks who are very, very good at manipulating the way complex groups think. And the model is a whole lot closer to George Orwell and an updated version of 1984 than any sort of a, a kind of desirable social change that we might be thinking about. Now, this is an interesting interview with George Lakoff, who I think is one of the uh, most interesting guys writing in this general area. And he raised an idea that I hadn't really thought about before. I'm not absolutely sure that it's true, but the concept, I think, is terribly important. Uh, basically, he says that Democrats who want to go into politics tend, tend to study policy and think in terms of this rational model. 
Republicans who want to go into policy tend to specialize in marketing-related fields and persuasion-related fields and are much more focused not in the development of the policy but the process of selling it. And that, he says, gives them an enormous advantage. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about in a lot more detail over the course of the seminar series is propaganda techniques and political advertising. And here are the ideas of George uh, Lakoff and Harold Laswell and lots of other folks show how you can manipulate these psychological biases and group dynamics in a way to get people to do what you want them to do. And instead of doing this in the service of the dark side, uh, power over societies, we need to figure out how to do this in the service of a democracy that really works uh, this power with society that I've been talking about. Um, so just a couple of very quick examples. This is an interesting article about how capitalists have created cool. This notion that particular products are worth buying because they're cool and it's based on a whole range of these complex psychological persuasion-based strategies. And these are the guys who really know how to do this. And social activists need to start understanding some of this. Um, with respect to the most recent election, and this might get all a bit outdated, um, but one of the things that President Trump was much better at doing than Democrats was to understand all of these cognitive biases. And given those biases, frame arguments in a way that builds support. And this article sort of starts to explain how this works. So this is something that you might call psychological persuasion or manipulation. And then there's this article that appeared recently in Time magazine, and this may get to be a much bigger story, that explains how social media, and this is the Russian social media influence American election campaign and some sort of still as yet fuzzy relationship with the Trump campaign. But the thing that they were able to do was to manipulate social peer pressure by using social networking platforms like Twitter to convey the impression that there were lots and lots of everyday people out there that agreed that Trump was the better choice for president. And what you're essentially doing with this is manipulating peer pressure uh, by creating fake people. And in some districts in the run-up to the election, according to this article, something approaching half of all Twitter posts were fake propaganda-based uh, efforts to manipulate things. So this is all a bit of a wake-up call. The, the folks who figured out how to work in the realm of social and psychological complexity are taking society down the path of a power over future. If we want a power with future, we've got to understand how a social and psychological-based strategy can be adapted in the service of the common good.